going to have because we're going to have a short panel session now where we can ask questions. Um, it could be, you know, tell me what's more, you know, what else is in the guide, or it could be uh, anything like that. So um, we've got a number of people in the room who were involved in uh, developing this. Can we have uh, Razif, Tony, Rob, and uh, Alison? All right, um, so here's the panel session before I uh, let the panel members introduce uh, themselves. Uh, I'm Razif Yusuf, um, I come from Shell. Uh, my portfolio is incident investigation and learning. So it just so happened, uh, two weeks before uh, we, my team, which consists of incident investigation and learning folks across Shell, uh, we were supposed to have a face-to-face -face meeting and Energy Institute launched uh, the guide, right? So, uh, so I quickly distributed the guide to my team. Hey guys, can you have a read before we meet? And uh, a few of us read and it was a very valuable um, guide for us. Uh, we were planning our 2017 to 2018. So we tested, like, uh, hey guys, what do you mean by LFI? So it is sort of agreed that it was broader learning. When we talk about LFI, it's all about you know, getting the organization learning. Then we tested, okay, so what do you do? And we suddenly quickly realized we were not doing broader learning stuff. We knew we wanted to do broader learning, but we were doing stuff that the learning happened on sites. And, uh, and uh, we quickly, okay, so what do we do next? And if you look at table 19 of the guide, there are already hints and tips on how we're going to achieve that, how we're going to embed uh, learning across an organization as big as Shell. Uh, out of, I think it was a dozen tips, we took three of them uh, for our 2017-2018 plan. Uh, there was another two we were tempted to, but we say, hey, uh, we cannot take it. It will be a 2018-2019 uh, kind of uh, plan. So, uh, heartful thanks to Energy Institute for publishing it just in time for us. <laughs> and um, so, before uh, I open the floor for questions, uh, if the individual panel kind of members can introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm Alison Little John from the Open University, and I was involved in some earlier research um, where we developed the LFI toolkit, which Matthew is going to. Tell us about the evaluation of that. Yeah, Tony, I'm from Centrica. Um, I'm also a board member of the Trouble Foundation, so bringing schizophrenic mode this afternoon. Uh, Rob Miles, I chair the uh, Human Factors Committee that uh, is responsible for um, sponsoring the report. And I have a long interest in uh, failure to learn because it's just it's a socially unacceptable now, and I think we've really got to focus on making sure we don't repeat our mistakes. We all know it, but it's how to do it. Yeah. So I'll open the floor if anyone has any questions. Yeah. Well, I'll start with one. <laughs> I'm James Fairburn, I'm a process safety engineer in Chevron. Um, I guess there's, so there's many reasons why I suppose organizations do fail to learn, and, 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 and some on my mind reflect on things like just the level of resource required to be proactive and I suppose you answer that partly in the guide when you in that slide you're showing about sort of the filtering and the categorization prioritization of incidents to determine the investigation level and some are more resource intensive than, than others I suppose that, you know another fact that always plays my mind is around um, kind of when the lawyers start getting involved um, and that broader learning and, and sharing of information certainly outside the company, but actually even within the company, it's, all, it's often sometimes only those that need to know, seem to know um, wh why the change has occurred. I mean, d d does the guide, d does that talk about some of those factors, particularly that last one? Um, yeah. 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 You want to pick it up? Yeah. Uh, you wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, 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 first of all, absolutely right. When you're saying that, 
the discussions that we've had in this room or even developing that this guides about you know how do we deal with the legal stuff and all that lot. It was brilliant to see lots of people coming up with great ideas as well. So I'll hand over to Ed if you wrote if you wrote the stuff and tracked it together. Well I will certainly cover what, what's in the, the guidance. So there are uh, uh, aspect is addressed quite early on because it is seen as a potentially significant blocker. Um, and we did have quite a lot of um, ideas, tips, if you like, for ways around it, none of which are you know, 100% foolproof. So they're, they're things that will improve uh, the sharing rather than get around that issue completely. Um, but uh, I mean, things like you know, turning events, anonymizing them, turning them quickly into perhaps slightly more generic, but people focusing more on the hazards and, 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 and how to prevent that, that occurring and, and cause all consequential issues. You're, you're taking the names away, you're taking a lot of the context away, which in some ways dilutes the value, but at least it, it puts some information out there quite quickly. Um, that was an example of something that companies are doing at the moment. Uh, but perhaps I'll pass over to the rest of the panel who might have other specific tips on that. Our work has focused really on the people. Um, when you when you disseminate uh, learning from incident investigation, then how can you encourage and motivate people to be part of that process? Um, so I think it would be. I mean, Matthew's going to talk much more about um, the ways that we would encourage that and an evaluation of the reality of it and whether or not it's how we can get people on board. But I think the motivations of, of the people are very important. I should say my own background, so I'm, I'm a professor at the Open University and I view learning as a, a psychological process. It's what, what goes on in our brains. It's not about um, incident information and how we disseminate that. So, uh, so perhaps my response to you is, is a little bit influenced by that. For me, I, in previous work uh, life, I used to go into organisations and have to make very quick assessments, usually two or three days on site on an offshore rig or refinery. And I learned that looking at a pre previous incident and how they responded was one of the best indicators if you only had one thing you could do in the time you were there. So you've got senior management talking about and trying to promote a good safety culture, and then you've got what really goes on when something's happened. And what you find very often is what's gone on doesn't align with the senior messages. That's not to say the senior message isn't honest, it's just that there's a significant gap between the intention and the reality. And so what I would do is look at the intention, the stated policies of openness, learning, response, sharing of information, and then walk the incident with people and say, well, were you told what happened? Were you invited to participate in the investigation? Have the lessons been made available to the other sites? All the things that you'd expect to see. And then just do a gap analysis, gap analysis between those and the stated objectives. Because the reality of that was that often people in senior positions were quite horrified by how different what was actually going on was what they thought. I started with the prejudice that they would know there was a big gap and that there was some intention in that. But actually I learned it wasn't. It was largely people doing their best and, and failing for various reasons. And a prime example would be something like a heavily edited report or redacted mm -hmm. in an organisation which professed open learning. So you just you don't have to get into a big argument. You just put the two on the table next to each other and say, ask people to walk through how they've ended up in that place. And sometimes it's for legal reasons, and you do put a lot of effort into how you have to take control of your legal team and remember who, who is running the organisation and why. It's not perfect, but those are real challenges. But I think it, how an organisation learns through its incidents and responds to them is really one of the best quick indicators of the actual culture, because you can get it and follow it through. I think it's also quite important to say what the guide is not. The guide is not the definitive way to learn from incidents. Because I don't know what it is, and nobody knows what the definitive way to learn from incidents is. What we did was got the best people and the best brains in the room, and through that process of reporting through to broader learning and all those steps, we said, what's the best today? 
and let's tell people what that is. Now, today's best, hopefully in 10 years' time, will be tomorrow, will be laggards, yeah? because we will do it. So the guide is telling you what is the best practice we could find today. Nothing more, nothing less. But structuring it in those phases gave people a lot of ways of thinking. And I was amazed just how much best practice that I picked up. I went, oh, that's so obvious. Why didn't I think of that through those workshops? And I see the body language of my colleagues doing exactly the same thing. Yes, we learned a lot just by sitting there. Yeah, not just by contributing, even though they were contributing a huge amount. Let's go for questions like that. Do you want to pass the mic? question for you regarding um, something that I believe is probably a factor in learned from incidents is we do a lot of investigations, we review the investigation reports, generate corrective actions, etc, etc. But historically I think what we're really talking about is, is that the memory of incidents, past incidents, uh, are things that are overlooked. And so what, if anything, has the PAM done to look at how we can um, maintain the memory of past incidents. So let us assume that we had a good investigation, we had the correct corrective actions, and we closed them up um, suitably and sufficiently. Um, but as years go by, we forget about the, the history. So can you tell me a little bit about the work that you might have done in this area? <coughs> Okay, 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 okay. All right, cool. Yeah, I think I think it's a really good question. So thank you very much for asking it. And, and that concept of corporate memory, yeah, um, it's amazing. Like, it really hit me. Ooh, 15, 20 years ago, I was in a meeting somewhere. I think it was the um, what was then the AMP forum, and we were talking about Piper Alpha. And one of the guys said, "Yeah, it was really bad. What company was it?" I said, "Yours." <laughs> You know, and that's a really bad example of corporate memory, yeah? Because it is a very, very tricky. But let's not beat ourselves up too much about pushing out this way. Because actually, we can do an awful lot when we ingrain stuff into our processes, into our management systems, into our procedures. It may sound quite boring and stuff like that. But we change our designs, yeah? How many of you can remember not having inertia wheel seat belts? how difficult it was often to put seat belts on. And we changed the design and now it becomes instinctive to do that. First all front seats, then back seats. Yeah? Not having airbags in cars. There's a huge amount that we all do yeah, in our businesses that actually is learning from So don't beat yourself up too far. And then there's some really great practices of, of, of that's instantaneous. Yeah? Is there a safety alert on such and such? And I have seen some organizations that actually have really organized their safety alerts so well that when a work permit comes up, it'll pull out a safety alert that says, do you know five years ago someone got hurt doing this kind of job? Yeah? And that, that's actually really great practice. So it, it's, it's, don't knock it too much, but it's absolutely right. Keeping it alive, yeah? And it's all about that just-in-time information that's the tricky one. Yeah, I agree. And I think it touches on risk assessments, which is quite often risk assessments fail to mention the things that happen before. There's a very important role for accident reports, incident narratives, people talking about them, reading them, making them available. Aviation is extremely good. Most people in aviation can rattle off the registrations of the aircraft and the crash. They all know the accident, they all know why. We tend not to be so good in other sectors, for various reasons we don't share the incidents that way. Um, I think the other thing is I find that people find it very hard to read across from an incident that, as an outsider, you say, obviously is relevant to their job, but they find the small difference between that incident and what they're doing, and focus on that instead of the read across. And I think there's a real role for us, all of us involved in safety and risk control, to help people understand the read across, because what I've learned is they don't find it natural. They've got to be walked through it. And I, I've got an example from some years back, an installation uh, oil uh, lubrication fire on a generator, resulting in a full shutdown of Dow Manning. Um, it was caused by lubricating 
location oil which set fire to the diesel fuel supply, it failed to shut off and they couldn't find a manual shut off. Three days later, I got an assist for installation. I said, walk me through that incident, show me why it can't happen here. They said, it can't happen here because we use gas fuel on the generators. Now, that was the only difference. You know, 95% of what they did was the same, but the 5% was enough to explain why it wasn't a relevant lesson. And they genuinely believed that. So I think we do have to help people make the reading. Um, in, if you look at the guide towards the end, there is um, some guidance on how we, we can embed the learnings in your organization. And when my team met, again using the guide, um, what are the stuff that we can do to repeat what we can do that embed learning so that as soon as you leave the company and somebody comes in, he or she can learn from a particular incident. So we found one tool that was um, uh, that was already having a, an evidence of that, which was our electronic permit tool. So if you want to do confined space, then a, something will pop up in the system saying that, hey, there was an incident similar to what you want to do. And um, it's just a short synopsis. If you're interested, you click on it and then you get uh, the detailed information. So that's what was available. Uh, when we read the guide, then we, uh, we, we saw that, hey, there are people, there is a group of people in Michelle that we do not have enough conversations with. These are the technical folks, so either mechanical engineers or the turbine folks. Um, and uh, after the meeting, uh, we engaged them and then they are so hungry for incident information. So this is very, very recent. Huh? <laughs> so it is all arising from the guy. So uh, what we did was, um, arising from the conversation, we then link my uh, learning from incident database to their SharePoint site. So whenever an incident pops up, yeah, before, before you upload the, the, the learning, you click, this is a mechanical engineering um, uh, discipline, and then will automatically go to the SharePoint site. And the mechanical engineers now can see the most recent learning from incidents that come up for, uh, for them. So that, those are, uh, that's how the guide helped us when we took out table 19 and started to look at one by one, what are these, we believe these are good stuff. What can we do and uh, how can we use this guide and what can we do? And, and, and it has uh, proven itself at least in two occasions uh, for, for us in the past few years. So from our own perspective on how people learn from incidents, uh, we, we've been particularly interested in what are the indicators of learning and how how can we see that, that people have actually learned? Um, so some of the uh, materials uh, that we've, we've developed and worked with have involved um, team managers talking through incidents and trying to to help people understand the relevance to their work, especially if it's not a, a, an incident that's directly on the site or from another site. Um, so it's it's through that reflection and thinking about how how can I change my practice and how can that change in practice be permanent that, that we embed the learning within people's work. And one something that no one has mentioned so far are contractors. So the role of the contractors in this process. Are they part of the process? Um, are they reporting incidents um, in the same way? Um, and so I think that's an important area that we need to focus on. Um, clearly maintaining memory over sort of long, the long term is, is a challenge. And, and I think some, some of the things we've said are ways to improve it, but, but it will exist as a challenge. In, in the guidance, there are a couple of case studies around testing memory. Um, to, to see whether the organisation indeed has these things embedded in it. Um, so those could include things like changing a previous event in a, in a way that the scenario is a bit different, but it still has the same challenges, the same decision-making issues, 
within it and seeing whether people make the same mistakes again or if they generally the organisation and the people in it have, have indeed learnt. So there's a few uh, examples and case studies like that in, in the guidance. Uh, Imperial College Health Partners. I work in patient safety, uh, vision and patient safety program. And my question is to do with the application of the guidance or the guidelines outside of incidents. So one of the big things in healthcare at the moment is that every organization should be a learning organization. And if all that we've done in safety and quality goes well, then hopefully one day we get to a point where organizations are not having as many incidents. Um, there's also the application to organiza organizations that are starting out new and shouldn't have a history of incidents anyway. And then there are organizations like mine who try to influence um, our partners to have a learning culture. How much does the guidance apply to the, the work we seek to do in the sense of um, helping an organization to be a learning organization without necessarily focusing on incidents. Yeah, I'll answer that. Um, I'm actually looking at that at the moment and the read across um, to healthcare. Uh, one of the things with healthcare is that you don't have incidents in the same way. You often have decline uh, over a period of time. and. If you're defining that successfully, you can still investigate it. It won't look in the same way as an incident does for an oil industry site, but it's an adverse outcome and it's an unintended event. And I think once you've got things not going as to plan, then you've got something you can get in and understand. Um, so I think there's the issue of how you reframe it. The other thing is that something we all share here is that we're trying to move forward in the process towards leading indicators. So instead of an incident being the failure of, in terms of the event and the loss of containment if it's oil and gas, we would want to define an incident as a fail of the preventative measures rather than the occurrence. We would be, uh, in our terms, a safety critical element has failed and that would be taken very seriously. And if you look at air traffic control, they don't monitor mid-air collisions, they monitor separation because they're working a long way ahead of events. And I think that's one way of looking at it. You move forward in the process and you look for failures that are the precursors to the event, not the event itself. That's your target, and you're trying to get ahead in time. That, by the way, is a lot easier said than done. <laughs> yeah, d d just to add to that, so we're applying the lots of the things within the guidance in the, in, uh, in the context of an emergency service in the UK. Uh, and there, as you say, they don't necessarily have an incident, something going wrong each time, but following attending a, an emergency, there will be a debrief, uh, there will be a list of things that hopefully went right, maybe a few things that went wrong didn't lead to an actual incident, but there's still things that you can learn from. So when you add up things like that, plus exercises, etc., etc., there can be a lot of more information out there which an organisation can learn from over and above incidents. Uh, Mike Shakespeare, Fleetwood Multiple College. Um, I work with the Merchant Navy at the moment, uh, but three things that have been mentioned recently, memory, learning and confined spaces. Um, now, we all know about confined spaces. There's legislation, there's regulation, there's company procedures, there's risk assessments, there's permits. Everybody in the Merchant Navy has to do a confined space entry training course. And we're still killing people. Is there any help in here to deal with that human element disconnect? space and you could put that into road traffic accidents you could put that into a working from heights there are a number of excavations i could set a number of risks where i could say exactly the same thing happens 
I think your question is far is more than that for that. And I think what came across is things like classification of human error. So do you actually know what type of human error is causing most of those? And if you don't, then maybe that's your first step to find out. If you do, then if it's a you know, if it's a violation because they're trying to get things done quicker, that's very different to if they just forgot what to do. So, so your first step is actually going down the causal chain, and the guide is very strong on telling you what is the causal chain, it's got that chain in, find out the human errors, and then find out what's the underlying precursors that are creating that event. So, so it's actually, it seems relatively straightforward and simple, yeah. Um, but it's structuring some stuff and data to see that you can do that. And I'll talk more about that later. So come up to it afterwards and after my presentation about how you can structure data so that you can have different conversations. And I think that's what you need to do. If you just focus on the, oh, somebody's died because, someone's died in a confined space, or from high road traffic accident, you're talking about the events. So probably the wrong conversation. But the guy's got a strong one. I share your um, uh, sort of frustration about confined space, and you know in agriculture sometimes it's a family that die in a confined space, a brother goes to rest with another brother. It's very tragic, and it's very, very frustrating that we are, these incidents are repeating, and we're still not really getting to the bottom of it. You know, one of the reasons we're here is because we share that frustration over a number of types of incidents. And the number of people who fall, we've all grown up with gravity. We should understand it by now. Um, but there's something that means we don't. And that is about reminding people, refreshing, constantly reinforcing. Now, I know in merchant shipping, people don't think that it's going to go wrong when they go into confined space. They have a belief it's all going to be fine. And we really fundamentally have to change that appraisal of what's going to happen. In the same way, we have to change their appraisal of driving too frequently. Because it will go wrong. the human factors in the behavioral and risk tolerance aspects as well that make the talk a lot about you know my perception of risk and your perception of risk are two totally different and some are based on, on education and knowledge and others are just pre preconceived conceptions uh, and if we don't address some of that as well then we'll never get to I, 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 that's a very important point because I did do an analysis of confined space entry fatalities recently and over half of them were people who've been in the job less than a year and that tells you a really important thing, that, that whatever was going on across all the sectors, they were not being given the experience of the older people to how to avoid what was happening. So there was already there something going on. The other thing was that about half the fatalities were people who got the help. It wasn't even the person who had the accident. Yeah. So, so there's a whole lot there about informing people about how dangerous this is before they have the accident. Is it also a case that in the old days you could make have accidents, um, hopefully not fatalities, and you'd learn by them? Nowadays, nobody's allowed to have accidents because HSE come in and knock you on the head. Um, so now people have to learn. That's why I spent my time doing is trying to teach people about all the accidents I did in the past and trying to get them not to do them now because they won't get away with it. I do remember a very old um, association of drilling contractors in the days when somewhat risque um, cartoon calendars were there of um, two rather scantily dressed girls heading to a nightclub going, my car be a driller, not enough gold and too many fingers. Yeah, um, was, was the comment behind that. And isn't it great that drillers actually have all their fingers now? It is actually part of our success, yes, it makes it more difficult in terms of experiential learning. Of course it does. Yeah. But that's actually a good thing. You should be really proud of it as a profession. Yeah? How many of your organizations set a fatal accident target? <laughs> yeah, it's absolutely absurd, isn't it? Yeah. But thirty years ago it wasn't. And that's something that we should be massively proud about. Yeah? There's a long way to go.
incident information or incidents that they weren't involved with or, or weren't part of their organization and thinking about how that impacts on their practice so that they, they're, they're reminded of, of the importance of, of practice being a particular way. Yeah. Uh, we've got time for maybe two more questions or so. We've got a question here from Lee. Um, but, uh, uh, there were a few hands that were up uh, over here earlier. Was there anything else? If you have a question, maybe if you put your hand up, just down, we can try and get that. Yeah. We might not be able to get all of you. I've got a very quick question, Leon, for the, the European Process Data Centre about um, the potential blocker of different languages in a multinational company as far as broadening the learning. Do you want to say just a little bit about <clears throat> that factor? from some of their vessels and they know the incident rate is roughly the same but the nationality of the crew is different. Mm. There are very, very strong cultures and I think the first thing is you have to know that. You can't take what's going on at face value. You need to understand the culture. And the lesson from shipping is whatever you do has got to fit with the culture of your crew because you can't force them into doing something different. Mm. If they're a very social culture, they come from the same village or they're all related as often happens on board a ship, then whatever you bring in has got to work for them. You can't go in conflict with their belief system. And that's quite difficult. And that is the way this is going to go. Yes, well, I think I was answering one. Yeah, for that. Uh, for one, one is uh, the industry of for like us uh, having gone to a database like a Skybrary or something like that or a tool really to, to learn from generic events, so it's useful for everybody. And then another thing is just culture as well, how to deal uh, and to set it right so it doesn't in, uh, delay the process or, or impend, no, the process of investigation, of analysis. So uh, uh, I think uh, the, the blaming should be placed always not at the investigation, but before, in, in case, no, and, and setting up the limits uh, clearly, so it doesn't affect the, the analysis. No? So I, I would like to see if you, you did, did answer on, on that point. And then uh, we, we found risk perception that you just talked about it as well, very important, no? so do workshops uh, about uh, linking with the, I think you talked a little bit about that, linking risk analysis, no, important. And, uh, well, and the organizational changes, there are a few areas that are difficult to, to analyze, no? all the, the risk from organizational changes that you all as well cover. Well, I mean, there was a lot there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yes, I think organizational change is a risk, and, and we see that go wrong. Um, what do we do? We try to help people through something which is not especially easy. And there are quite a number of organizational and you know, it's done a really good job of flushing out the barriers to this. But the part of the thing is identifying what the barriers are in your own organization and then you've got to start breaking them down. There really isn't a, sh a shortcut to this. You know, one of the things is nobody has said this is easy, have they? <laughs> and when we have those workshops, we all came here, I have to say, you know, I would collect myself, we all thought we knew a fair bit about this. It wasn't quite the way it played out, was it? Mm -hmm. Totally different. <laughs> totally different. And I think that, yeah, <coughs> let's give you an idea of how this guide should be used. Pick it up, yeah? Go through those steps that I've showed you about reporting, investigation, triaging, yeah? Think about that and say, where is my good, where, where, am, I good, where am I bad in my organisation? You know your organisation better than anyone else does, does or any consultant does, yeah? Where am I good? Where am I bad? Which is which one? And then pick one and say, you know, this is a blocker. And show the, the graph that said, you know, ability to learn dropping down. Yeah? Where's your biggest step off at the moment in your organization? I don't know that. Find out for that for yourself. Turn to that chapter of the book and say, what could I pick? Which gem could I pick of that? And do that first. Yeah? And that's really the right use of time like this. Yeah? Where's my weakest point? Fix that. Then go on and fix the next one. Then go on and fix the next one. 
I think we've got time in just for one more question, actually. Yeah, I'm, I'm Lafi al Fahim from Kuwait. And Ed, in the beginning of the presentation, you mentioned the risk profile. And you said learning from, 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 from incident will decrease you know, uh, the, risk, the risk profile. Incidents and near misses. Is that encouragement to reduce the, also the near misses? Beginning of the presentation, it's down the incident and the and the near misses. Uh, yes, I mean absolutely. The the looking at those near misses and, and precursors is a key part of building up the information you've got to, to learn from. Uh, the, the more material there is there, providing your organisation isn't getting swamped and and become sort of paralyzed by too much information, then it's key to be looking at those and giving yourself maximum opportunity for learning to drive down the risk levels. So yes, uh, that, that is a, a big message of the guidance. I, I could make a comment from something, a conversation I had over a decade ago now with somebody in an energy company. Uh, I, I was trying to advocate uh, near miss reporting. And uh, this is somebody fairly senior, and they said, we don't need it, we're having enough incidents to get the information we need. <laughs> now, you know it's wrong. <laughs> okay, okay, last question, and then we'll have to move on to the next one. Thank you very much. This one is, is a question relating to a study that's currently being undertaken by a gentleman by the name of Charles Cowley. It is the work that he's currently doing, uh, and I actually have scheduled for an interview with this gentleman, is that something that is an extension of the work you've done, and is there a follow-up report that will be published, or some publication? Yeah, that's that'll Stuart, because Stuart can tell you more about that. <laughs> <laughs> so we actually funded his study. Yes. Um, so it, it's, it's not a follow-up, it's a separate piece of uh, research that he has independently uh, undertaken, but, yeah. but we have decided to, to fund it because we see merit in and so from that there will be a, uh, obviously what's a PhD, there will be a thesis um, and uh, we will take a look at this, this, this research afterwards and see if there's something that we can, can do with that to make it more, I it might be like uh, that's right. Well, yeah. Thanks. Um, okay, well, um, just while I start setting up, oh, I did, I'm sorry, uh, we could probably just let the panel, everybody here know that that study relates to how safety leadership mm. uh, helps prevent incidents and that's why yes. it's interesting. So, 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 so the study that uh, we're referring to is looking at the, um, the almost paradox between different ways of, uh, of, of uh, if, you, if you have a high reliability organisation, often you, you think of that as being uh, adaptable, it can, it, can, uh, it can see problems and, and adapt and... Uh, Resilient. That, in, in a way, is, 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 is almost a paradox when you, when you look at the, the classical way of, of seeing how a, you know, a well-run organisation is one with a strong command and control structure. Um, they're two very different ways of thinking. And so the research is, is looking at how do organisations, and how do leaders in particular, flip between those two modes of thinking from being very much command and control to trusting people to make the right uh, decisions to uh, adapt. That's my understanding anyway. Yeah. Um, so, okay, um, well, let's thank our uh, speaker and our, and our panel. Uh,